Hi, welcome to the course Strategies for Innovation and Design on Bioengineering. My name is Luis Soengs and I'm Master in Science in Engineering uh, in Biomedical Engineering from the Johns Hopkins University. And today I'm going to start with these class lectures on medical design uh, innovation and medical engineering innovation in which we are trying to explore all the strategies and all the tips and tricks that you're going to see are very useful in order to be successful in this cluster. Uh, but first, as the first issue in this course, we're going to try to explore what uh, medical devices, what is vial design in the first place, and how, gen in general terms, how to be successful in this course. All right? So let's start. Bio design is the holistic process of finding, planning, developing, and executing medical device innovation. You know, it requires interaction of all the elements in the medical technology ecosystem, or med tech ecosystem as I call it, uh, to facilitate adoption and impact to change lives. All right? So if you, ha if you don't have that impulse of saving lives and eventually change the health and, the, and, and to minimize the pain or to change something in the medical device industry, then the biodesign process is not for you. But if you have that compelling passion to solve a clinically relevant problem and to make an impact in lives, then this is the right course for you, all right? Well, we talk about this ecosystem in the biodesign process, and what you can see is that an ecosystem as in nature, uh, in the biodesign field, is an ecosystem in which any, every stakeholder involved in this process has to interact. There is the innovator, so you, and you how in the way you're going to become at the end of this course and you're going to be surrounded by by several stakeholders including not only research centers and universities but also in intellectual property advisors regulatory affairs specialists agency specialists where which you are going to have to interact eventually in your um, when you're trying to regulate or approve a medical device of course, medical specialists and other types of uh, clinically relevant stakeholders as hospital administrators, nurses, and technicians, um, hospitals, commercial partners, manufacturers, private R&D technicians or technical advisors or research teams, and of course, yourself, who is involved eventually in the very middle of this process and basically you are going to be the one that is going to uh, try to put together all the different preferences and all the different things that every stakeholder likes in a single compelling medical device that has a strong clinical, economical, and technical value proposition. Right? But what is a medical device? You know, it's it's very it's sometimes very difficult to think that if you're going to do innovation in the medical device field, that you don't know what a medical device is. But it's quite common that as an inventor, you don't know the exact definition of what a medical device is. So that's why I brought this slide in which I try to convey that a medical device is, you know, anything that has a clinically relevant, um, that performs a clinically relevant task or that has a clinically relevant intended purpose but that can range from the low tech to the very established technology, high technology, and all in the between. So a medical device could be a Q-tip, a syringe, or a bandage, but of course a medical device can also be a stent, a MRI, a computerized tomo a CT scan, or an infusion system. And of course, many upcoming technologies every time are making this more difficult for people to actually know if this is a medical device or anything else. Such as mobile technology, cell phones, and medical apps make it sometimes very difficult to know if this is a medical device or it's only an application for someone to improve their health. Um, but again, of course, regulation is there for us and we have um, a very harmonized, strong, definition that we can use as our uh, starting point for this course. Okay, so going to the next slide, uh, the section 201 
from the FDA Cosmetics Act in the FDA regulation system it tells us that uh, the term device is actually defined as a instrument, apparatus, implement, machine, contrivance, implant, in vitro reagent, or other similar or related article, including any component part or accessory that you know you can read there, but that has a that its its intended use is for diagnosis treatment, prevention, and that is recognized by the national agency and that it has a structure intended to function in the body of a man or a mammal that does not, and this is the important part, does not achieve its primary intended purpose through metabolic, immunological, or chemical action within or outside the body. And if you think a little bit about this definition, you can see that Anything that is a drug or a pharmaceutical goes outside the scope of this definition. You know, it's a, if, it, a very simple way of, of looking at this thing is that if you can think of the physical or mechanical reason why something works, and that's exactly the pr primary uh, physical effect that is causing that device to work, then you can know that it's a medical device. If, on the other hand, you find that the primary, uh, the, the science that makes this device work holds on fundamentals of chemistry and metabolism and genetics and biological sciences, then it's probably a drug and you have to steer away from it in this course at least because we are not gonna explore uh, many of the regulation uh, and innovation design techniques for those type of uh, devices, or in this case, drugs. So if you can see in the slide, I have, uh, I, I have selected some of the important parts, which again, basically a medical device is any device that it, it achieves it, its primary intended purpose not by metabolic action, not by the use of any drug but by any other means. Now that we know what, a bio, what biodesign is and what the ecosystem looks like a little bit and what a medical device is, then you are here to bring value to that ecosystem, to create something that is worthwhile pursuing and that it's valuable for everybody. And for that, we need to know how the value of a medical device actually grows. That's the starting point too. And so if you see in the next slide, what is needed to bring value to the medtech industry and in specific to the medical, um, medical device industry, you can see that the value, value generation graph goes from almost nothing uh, in, in the basic research part to its top value during sales. All right, and we're gonna explore this in the, in, in the next way. As you go in, as you find something really valuable in research, you're gonna see that there is, there is research that can be applicable and there is research that, that cannot be applicable at least in the present time or in the near future. But as you find an application for that research and if that application is clinically relevant, then you're gonna see that the value is gonna grow. After having a, a, an initial, very initial research like proof, proof of concept, you're gonna move into your idea or concept innovation phase, which is the first uh, square in purple in the graph. In that, in that moment, you have an idea. You have an innovative, or what you believe is an innovative idea that uses that basic research and apply science to do something meaningful. But then, that's not the thing. Many people think that that's the place where you know, value comes into the equation and actually doesn't that much. It's not, only, it's not until you do your market research, your technical, technical viability studies, and your intellectual property protection a strategy in which you actually bring even more value to the technology. So you have an idea, you protect that, you validate that there is a market and there is a need, and then that constitutes what I call a feasibility analysis. And then you go by and try to solve this with uh, your own ways of solving it. No? You can do this by many ways, you know, rapid prototyping, implementing mechanical engineering, manufacturing engineering, software, hardware engineering, industrial design, biomedical engineering, any field that is useful for you to solve the problem, you can use it. 
And then in that moment, you have actually accomplished what we call design and engineering tasks or milestones. In that part, you have bring substantial value to the innovation and then you can go into a clinical or pre into preclinical and then clinical phases of your research. First, of course, for many, medic for many medical devices, after designing your prototype, your functional prototype, you're gonna test that in vitro or even before in the bench. Then you're gonna try these with living things on a Petri dish, which is called in vitro. Then you're gonna try to prove that this works in vivo, in an animal, in a preclinical study, and then you're gonna try to, to see if this actually works in a human, in what is called a clinical phase or clinical trial part of your biodesign process. Coming back after the trials, you can go and then try to transfer your technology in what it's called a technology transfer phase, in which more, even more substantial value is, is, can be brought to that technology. And after that, you can go into a pre-commercial phase and then a commercial phase in which sales uh, can be accomplished. So as you can see in the next slide, the success of a medical value, so the way in which value comes to medical device comes through partnering. Right through research and a very in-depth clinical work, through R&D to solve the problem with an, with an engineering solution that it's ingenious and novel and non-obvious, uh, with academia, which at the end provides many, many means and substantial re uh, resources to do this, and of course through business, because if there is no commercial viability on whatever you do on the biodesign process, there is probably not going to be any space for you to compete. So at the end of the day, how does this process of, um, of filtering down needs and creating feasibility analysis and prototyping things, how does this come into a process that makes sense and that makes it easy for students, new technologists, innovators, or whoever is interested in this, to actually be successful? Well, as there is no secret sauce for it, for it, it can be it can be said though that there are many initiatives that want to create a process that tries to make this easier. For instance, the Stanford Biodesign and of course the Johns Hopkins Bioengineering Innovation and Design course um, have created uh, first as a biodesign a Stanford initiative, but then as many others have um, re a reply. Uh, the process starts with analyzing all the med medical technology or med tech ecosystem variables, which consist of, uh, of analyzing the clinical need, the IP, the market, the regulatory affairs surrounding that type of products, uh, all the R&D, the, the research and development activities, your, you know, how you go by and sell your invention, how the society perceives your invention or the concept that you're trying to, to come up with, all the stakeholders, the cost, reimbursement, and everything that you know is needed for a product to go into market. Then that goes into certain filters that some might be quantitative and some others might be quali qualitative. But at the end of the day, you have personal or institutional filters, you know, like a market bigger than $15 million or $500 million or whatever it's your in inclusion criteria. But then after those filters, you can filter down needs and projects that you can pre-select and try to see if the engineering capacities that you have in-house are enough to, to create to, to bring value to the technology. And if you need other type of expertise, if you can bring that to your project. And after that, you can either know for sure if that project is not worth pursuing and go back to the drawing board and select more projects. Or if you have a better chance of success with this project uh, compared to the other ones. And of course, if you can after develop this, go into investment committees or business plan competitions or whatever you want to do and bring investment to your company and make this a reality. So many have described this process of biodesign as a stage gate methodology. 
stage gate because it has several gates that you have to pass in order to move to the next phase you know, and to bring value to the technology. And if you could see the slide here, um, I perceive the, the bow design process as a very simple four axis uh, graph that uh, moves throughout time. And basically the gates are in a, appear every time this line of knowledge, which is a line of knowledge, every time this line passes through any of these axes. So, for example, your product, your concept, can start in the clinical side of uh, the left axis. So with a very compelling clinical need, something that a doctor told you, something that you discovered on the hospital, and then you go, you go and learn a little bit more about the clinical. And then you move in time, and then you see that you, want, you, you are now in the phase in which you want to try exploring solutions, technological solutions, and then you learn more. And then you see that with that specific technological solution, then there is certain regulatory pathway and, and you are learning even more. And of course, you see what are the economics of that market and if that technology meets what the market asks you to do. And then you're learning more and more and more. And by learning more, sometimes you change on clinical strategy, on technological strategy, on regulatory strategy, on, or on economical strategies. But at the end of the day, your knowledge is always growing and you are passing these gates which not only gives you more information but also gives you a, a validation point that you are doing the right things in the right time with the right, with the right uh, approach. Okay, so that's why it's called gates. This process is not obscure at all. There are many small companies from academia and from fellowships in Stanford and from fellowships in or master's degree in the Johns Hopkins University, Michigan University, uh, throughout the U uh, and other universities throughout the U.S., in Europe, and of course in Latin America. And there are many companies that, for example, in, in the ones that I show here, which is a very small sample size of all the companies that have come through this type of process. And you can see that building a company upon a, a novel idea on medical devices is possible for you and for anybody that follows a process that is compelling, that it makes sense, and that is sound for anybody in the medical device industry. If we go to the next slide, you can see that, for example, for the Stanford Biodesign Program and the Johns Hopkins Biodesign Program, you can see that there are many, many stories of success. Many which have, are still on R&D, but many which have been acquired already. And these are acquisitions of millions of dollars worth uh, of uh, value that, you know, it's, it's, it's value that can be used later on to develop further this technology or to make other uh, medical devices companies. So this, um, at, the, uh, uh, at the end, this, this is a proof that the process makes sense and that at least has results somewhere in the world. And with this, we conclude uh, with the session of this introductory course for biodesign, innovation, and design, and for all these strategies that we are going to try to bring on to the table with you uh, throughout the semester. Thank you. See you later.